Episode 10, Symbols of Change. Almost every system is inherently corrupt. Each seeks its own preservation. Whether or not a system is healthy or perverted is a matter of checks and balances. Human beings create systems of control, and in doing so, create the need for power. This is ultimately to feel safe to grow both as individuals and as a species. Power itself can also be seen as a system of growth. Power by nature desires more to affect. An endless series of predatory relationships give rise for the sustainment of power. Respect must be shown in order to respect those who show homage. In such a system, a symbol is required. This symbol is the desolation of power. For example, a symbol of truth is the natural enemy of raw information. The surrounding projections synchronously segue into ANN's Erzot's anchorman reporting the recent shooting at the steeple. Tash passes briskly, utterly uninterested. Give me a We've already spoke to Resurrector Zaye to help shed light on this tragedy. We'll be back with more, but until then, let us share a moment of silence. On level 3, the quickest way from the quads to the shuttles is the platform elevator on the far side of the west wall. Entering the shuttles involves multiple scans, and Tesh is concealing a modified firearm. Smart play is a heel-to-toe race to the center ringlets, but Bison gave him an hour. There's no time for a walkabout. He surveys every passerby on the way as a possible threat. He does this a lot, but usually for no good reason. Looking over his shoulder with a keen awareness of his peripherals, he spots a possible tail. Nonchalantly, he stops in front of a small info portal, pretending to soak in the drama from the broadcast. All he's after is a sideways position to get a quick take of the suspect. Pale skin, green hair, red lipstick, and skin-tight orange overall. Nothing too out the ordinary about the man. He hobbles back a few steps, resuming his false interest before getting back en route. He loses sight of him by the time he gets to the platform lift to descend. He presses on the symbol attached to transport. On the way down, the elevator clanks against snags of metal and offset screws. It slows to a stop on level two, where a petite woman awaits to board. He can be swayed by what he can see beneath the hood of her sleeveless trench coat, but her off-putting demeanor does well to deter prying eyes. She positions herself behind him to his left. The scaffold lift has limited floor space, but Tesh can't help but feel that she's a step too close. The torrid air intensifies as they pass level one into the station on the mechanical level. He looks down at the Tesla pattern on the floor, broken up by smears of blackened ash, dry blood, and general decay. One of the inanimate sections of filthy chaos begins to take shape. He shrinks his eyes out. The object coalesces into a ghoulish forming miniature. Dripping strings of black goop begin to define the eyeless humanoid. The droplets sizzle as they hit the floor before dissolving. Small enough to stomp, the creature stands menacing. Its head is all mouth and fang as it opens to shriek at it. His sense of wherewithal makes a silent exit. Oh man! You see? Ooh. Paralyzed in fear, he feels a numb thud on his stomach. The pain hits when he looks down to see his hand holding off a spear-tipped tentacle jamming into his flesh. He must have caught it on pure reflex. He flails his free arm outward as an impromptu attack. Another reflex to the reality presented to him. His aimless swatting passes through the monster's head without contact. The miniature below ferociously nibbles at his pant leg. The sole of his foot feels an impact. The Mobius Bohemus smashes against the elevator wall, revealing the silhouette of a female no taller than the monstrosity's torso. Now he sees the target. She's using an Alpha Wave AR emitter, modded to blitz the amygdala. He may know somewhere in the back of his mind that this is not real, but his eyes aren't as smart. The body responds to what's visible. He's angry he's just now remembering he has a gun holstered on his lower back. He thrashes to grab it and attempts to straighten his arm to aim. The gun is knocked out of his hands by another lashing. Oh, man. He hears a recognizable tone that cuts through the overstimulus, sobering his senses. He left the EEG earpiece on. He's hammered by a stinging blow to the leg, but this does not unnerve his focus. He fires up the Zeus malware with a thought. This common man's program hijacks the communication between the antenna and the resistor of a circuit. He puts his hands up to brace for a wild flurry, giving him an opportunity to grab his earphone. He snaps another kick at her, this time followed by a fearless lunge. The shapely female form disrupts the illusion once again. 
and he's ready for it. He grabs at her head, hoping his palms are close enough to her ears and shouts. Run, Gamma Theta Scan! While initiating Zeus. A high-pitched human voice cuts through the low end from the grotesque colossus. The stereoscopic edges of the onyx tentacle start to lose phase as its transparency shudders. She tries to pry free for an instant. But the high-band frequency scans interacting with her modded implant seem to have induced a seizure. The EEG earbuds scold him, forcing him to release his vice grip. They bounce off the ground smoking and let out a digital death rattle. She palpitates violently with the supernatural imagery of her aberration above convulsing in mimicry. He pats her up and down, feeling for the emitter. The tornado of swishing serrated black threads passes through him, leaving him untouched. But the panic is still very much real. He makes out a circular medallion hanging from her necklace. He grabs at it, but struggles to steady her long enough to get a good hold. Finally, he snatches it backward, and quickly inspects it to confirm. The vanity plating can't hide its luminescent guts shining through the tiny holes at its edge. He places the rounded flat steel over the stained floor while using the same hand to balance him as he makes his way to his feet, already trying to slow down his breathing. He brings his knee to his chest, putting everything he has into the heel of his foot. He can hear his breath first. The pain takes a while to set in. The elevator door opens to an empty section of track. He struggles to the panel and elbows the emergency toggle, buying him some time to idle. He checks his hand by slowly rotating it in front of his face. A ugly gash diagonally stretches the length of his palm. Another hides in the crevice under his thumb. He looks down with a grimace. Painfully, he unbuttons his shirt to find the leak. The abdominal wound looks shallow, manageable, he assures himself. He removes his collarless blazer and rips off an arm sleeve from his undershirt to use as a tourniquet. The other sleeve he uses to wrap his hand. The attacker's head bobbles and starts to gargle between her sounds of choking. He looks at her floundering body and has an idea. He throws his blazer back on and picks up the gun from the opposite corner. She'll make a fine meal, he thinks. He slips the gun on her and drags her out by the ankle. He wonders if he'll have any lasting effect. This is the second time he's been a victim of a neural attack accompanied by augmented reality. The last time was a hazing at Mount Academy a lifetime ago. It left him with sternophobia for years. This is the fear of sneezing. The side effects can include a cornucopia of oddities, such as ermophobia, isotrophobia, and sometimes panphobia, the fear of everything. The ceiling creaks, and he can barely hear the faint squeal of an incoming shuttle. He drops her leg at the mezzanine's edge and bends his upper body laterally, investigating his pain threshold. He's got to pull himself together. He looks behind him at the girl on the floor foaming from the mouth. He thinks to himself if she didn't stab him in the gut, the hunching over to help her not swallow her own tongue would be a lot more tolerable. Too bad. The roaring shuttle zooms in, hugging the ceiling track. Eventually, it crawls to a stop. From where he's standing, he can see the curvature of the derelict station. The door slides open as he scoops the trembling assassin in his arm for the suffering moment. He boards the shuttle, facing the sensor scanner. He holds her in front of him as far as he can reach. Oblivious, she wiggles and drops her head. The speaker above the door sounds a tone of disapproval that goes unnoticed by the Arcadians on the last shuttle car. They simply can't be bothered. He finally drops her dead weight out of agony and pure exhaustion. The door is shut behind him and he leans back over the seal. The cylinder two pulls forward and bullets out of the station. He pours scorn down at the collapsed body below him. Do you work for me? He bends at the knees to retrieve the hidden gun while making it look like he's helping. Sucking in wind, he rallies enough strength to pick her up from the floor and prop her up in a seat. Kate officers will be waiting at the center sector station. Her face will be plastered all over their feet, so he'll have to put some distance between her to casually slip out undetected. By the time he makes it to center station, he's cozy playing the perfect stranger on the opposite end of the shuttle. The corpse burst in as he knew they would, but luckily it's only a two-man team. He walks right past the Kate officer's holographic red eye, sandwiched between the gas mask and the Kevin hat. The eye is a symbol of power, but also is capable of sophisticated penetrating scans. Thankfully, the Kate officer does not give him a double take. They shout at the hooded stranger to lay down on the floor. Their threatening demands for compliance go unanswered as Tesh follows the herd down the mezzanine to the exit. He takes a step on a long stretch of escalator ramp. The crowded path climbs up past the horizon. The ordeal is finally behind him. He has a brief moment to refocus. 
Arcadian's news network robs his attention, displaying the anchorman Brock Doda across the full length of the walls on either side of him. He looks up at the passing ceiling with the others for the best use of the camera frame. We are here with the resurrector of the center sectors and longtime mentor of Zed's Resurrector Zaid. I understand you're having a hardship witnessing the public assassination of your prized pupil in such a horrific way. He was one of my 13. This, this is considered an act of war for the Res. War? Wow! You heard it right here, on Right Now, with Brock Dota, Arcadian. This is not a publicity stunt. This matter is personal for me. And as it is for the millions of heartbroken fans of his music, of his gospel, we are launching a full investigation. All parties involved, even those called his friends, or so-called family, will be considered a suspect. Well, another reason to stay inside this ship until things calm down. Think KLS if you need a lift. We'll be back with more developments as they unfold in Arcadia. The walls transition back seamlessly to a collage of colorful adverts. His head drops into thought. The looping videos designed to captivate are made ineffective by Zai's ominous words. He has a past with the gang leader. Tesh didn't exactly approve of the Resurrector's influence on his brother. He might have been a bit too vocal about this in the past. The last meal they shared was sullied due to one of his outbursts. He refused to call him by the new name he was given, the name of his rebirth. Zaid was outraged by the disrespect of ceremony, but Zed was always there to buffer. The escalator runs out of track and he finds himself in the center ring, armed, with 32 minutes left on his countdown clock. He needs to put the ever-mounting list of possible hostile parties he's facing somewhere in the back of his mind. He needs to focus on the task at hand. This is something he can do much easier on the street. He puts one designer shoe in front of the other, gracefully speed walking the foot trap. He can't help but recognize the feeling Zaid's voice left him with. He remembers Bison's voice instead. You have an hour. He watches the minutes dwindle away before arriving at the side entrance to False Paradise. He pays no attention to the lengthy line awaiting entry out front. The doorman is already occupied with a disgruntled patron being escorted out. You, you better watch your back. I don't gotta watch my front. You know how I know? I kill you, that's how I know. Oh, Tess. Hey, man, what's with it? Bison signaled in, he told us everything. I hear it's gonna be crazy up there tonight. I hope not. <laughs> nah, man, just wait and see what we got for you. You're gonna like this. Tess twitches the top of his head to the side as the doors open full. Thanks, Rex. Stay dry, speaky man. He enters, wrinkling his eyebrow, questioning the henchman's choice of words. His puzzlement lingers making him slip up while entering the final archway from the VIP entrance. He forgot to hold his breath. The triggered blast of white mist emanates from above the doorway, a more concentrated dose of whatever psychotropics are already floating around the foggy refuge. He tries to cough it out, but it's already too late. His depth perception sharpens, but this is not enhancing his visual performance. Not until he adjusts to it. Now emotionally unstable once again, he fights to steady himself. The one who killed his brother is here. If not the killer, the only way to the truth. He can't force a solution, nor can he ever surrender. The room spins on. Thank you for listening. Make sure to check the links below and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Spotify at Stacks of Arcadia.